Hi, welcome to the Signal Pad. In this episode, we're going to try another repair. This is an Agilent E4981A, and this is a capacitance meter. Now, you may ask, well, what's so special about a capacitance meter if I already have a lot of LCR meters in my lab? And in fact, I do have some good ones. I've done some repair on some of the other ones. So why is, uh, why is this one special? Well, this particular unit is intended for very fast measurements, and this is essentially for production line measurement. Not only can it measure a capacitance at 2.3 milliseconds, uh, if you're running it at one megahertz, it also has exceptionally good accuracy. This is a 0.07% accurate uh, capacitance meter. So it's really intended for uh, characterizing and binning very precisely ceramic capacitors in a pr production environment. In fact, it even has a sync clock coming out of it, uh, which allows you to synchronize multiple things. It has several ports in the back that lets you connect to multiple instruments and synchronize your motorized assembly line as capacitors come in, new measurements, bin them, do a statistical analysis on them, and so on. So it's really a really quite a powerful unit uh, even it's working. And you can still buy this uh, from Keyside. It's about 12.5 US, 12 US dollars. So it's pretty expensive. I picked this up from eBay. It actually came from Korea. I didn't know that it was uh, from Korea when I kind of made an offer on it. So I ended up paying quite a lot for shipping, $150 to get this from Korea, which is just insanity. But nonetheless, I think it'll be fun to take a look at look at it. And there is a sign on it, uh, interestingly enough. I think there's a sign at the, up here, and you can see that it definitely came from Korea. And on the sign, it says uh, this, uh, this voltage is set to 220. Change it before you connect it to any other voltage. Well, this that sign is actually incorrect. Uh, this thing has a switching power supply that works from 100 volts all the way to 240, 50, 60 hertz. It doesn't really matter. But I guess this is a standard sign that they put on anything they sell. This is a, a kind of an equipment reseller surplus kind of place that I bought it from. So anyway, let's go ahead and turn it on and see what happens. And uh, I have already tried this once. Oh, there we go. There it is. So first thing is that the fan sounds quite bad. You probably can't hear it from the microphone, but it is uh, definitely going to need some work. Now, it takes a really long time to boot, uh, I guess, but I don't know what it's doing in the background. So at first, when I turned it on, I thought that this was the problem with it, but the, uh, on the auction, it actually set a different issue. So I got a little bit worried, but if you wait long enough, you will see something happen. I promise you, there it is. So it actually shows Keysight. Well, this is a good sign. It means that the unit must have been working up until very recently because it has a firmware that's newer than when the unit was built. Now, there's an error at down here. I don't know how well you can read it, but it says E1000, power on soft test failed, 0A200, and then four Fs in a row. So I looked at the service manual. There is really not that much information about it. Essentially, it says, if you see an error, send it for repair. And it turns out these four Fs uh, point to the CPU, some kind of a main processor board problem. So it doesn't boot up correctly. Now, maybe somebody tried to update the firmware, and that's what actually broke it. And that would explain why the firmware is the latest key site. So either way, I think it's worthwhile to take a look. Now, I try to communicate with it. It really doesn't do anything when it is stuck this way. Maybe there's a magical way of booting it up with holding some buttons, and then it will go into some safe boot mode. But anyway, they couldn't find it on a quick glance. No matter what, we're going to take it apart anyway to take a look at it. So it's worthwhile. Let me find out uh, what's going on. Oh, the other thing is that uh, I looked at the bottom, and the security stickers are intact. So no one has opened it up until right now. We're going to do it. All right, here we go. I took the top off. And as with a lot of these LCR and general impedance meter instruments, the case is quite nice. And here is the top case, top of the case here. And you can see it's metallized. And it's for, obviously, EMF and protection from any kind of interference. These are very nice cases. And I like them. This is the same one as my LCR meter. It looks the same on the inside. Now, this unit is made in Japan, as is the other LCR meters that I have. So these are pretty pretty nice instruments. So let's go ahead and see what we can do. I just opened it, actually, for the first time myself. So we are looking at it at the same time. Now, it's pretty clear that the portion down here is all the analog. That's how the angle of the waveform and digitizing the current and the voltage and finding how much phase shift is introduced. And that's how you calculate the impedance. All these sensitive um, circuitry is obviously hidden underneath this cage. There's two little capacitors poking out. It's kind of funny looking over there. So there's the USB cable coming to the front. And I see over here Xilinx. I can't see it there from my angle. It's a Spartan. So there's obviously some logic board here. So perhaps the FPGA is corrupted. And that's going to be pretty difficult to fix, unfortunately. And it looks like that you can push and remove this. So let me see if I can do this. Um, this is, 
Oh, there we go. I see what they're doing. Okay, so, oh yeah, so the power supply is actually connected to this. Let me see. If I can get this around. Can I remove it? Yes, I can. There it is. So there's a power supply there. It's obviously not powered right now, so you don't have to worry. Here's our fan that we're going to have to definitely pay attention to at some point in time, but it doesn't really matter anyway if it doesn't work. The fan is the least of our problems. So uh, this can actually sit on the side and I can power the unit while it's sitting on the side. It looks like that would be quite useful. So let's take a quick, quick look at a couple of other things I see here. So here's some interface boards. One of them is GPIB and the other one is some other interface proprietary, perhaps, I'm not sure, but uh, these are all the ICs required for communicating and driving the pins. There's another board here, interesting assembly structure. It's like a three-layer uh, PCB. This board at the back, the one that's sitting at the very bottom, is clearly handling power supply coming in, fused, some uh, capacitor filtering there, some I.O. driving chipset, some perhaps some very fast drivers for communicating between these boards. And you can see that from the FPGA, let me see, where is the LCD connected to? So here's the LCD from the front. I don't know if you can see from your angle. Probably not. And that goes into, that's the keyboard. And that cable is going from there, and it comes out of here. Interesting that the LCD is driven here. So perhaps this FPGA is actually not the main processor. Probably this guy over here is. And this looks like this board is part of this main board over here. And that turns out to be whatever this FPGA is controlling all the logic required to perform the functions for the actual impedance measurement. So the processor is down there, so we'll have to take a look at that at some point. And this big cable over here is responsible for communicating. So this communicating between these two boards. So this lo main logic board, this analog board with the digital section to it, very nice construction, nice grounds. You can see tapping onto the PCB, creating a very good connection. Now, the creating a nice quiet section here is very important and separating it here from digital circuitry and the power supply coming in is clearly part of that. You can see a DC DC conversion and voltage regulation done all the way here as far away as possible from the sensitive analog stuff. It's a very classic basic things you would do. The fan does seem to have an RPM measurement mechanism so perhaps it would warn you if the fan isn't working. So. We're going to have to take a closer look at it and see if we can discover something else. Maybe lower the camera a little bit here. Normally I cut these, but it will be easier so we can see if we can get a close look from underneath that board there. Yeah, so there is some connection going from here all the way to the top, and there is as well this board. And I really want to take this out. And actually, you know what? Yeah, definitely this is the processor because on the other side of this blue board at the bottom is where I have USB, Ethernet, and USB host and device and Ethernet and so on. So definitely we are looking at the main processor over here. Other than that, it looks really, really normal, nothing unusual. So how do we do this? Maybe, maybe remove this board and take a look at it and see what's on the other side of it. Uh, this cable over here, actually this is the GPIB, my mistake. These two are something else. So this is the GPIB cable going deep into there. This cable, wait a second, did I do this or this is how it was? Because this doesn't look like it's actually plugged in properly. Oh no, it wasn't. Maybe I did that. Ah, interesting. I, well, I hope this is not the problem because that would be really boring. But it definitely was unplugged. Maybe I pulled it while I was trying to remove the power supply. Perhaps that I did this, I, I'm not sure. I have to go back to the, to the camera and try it out. Well, now that I plugged it in, <laughs> let's, well, let's turn it on again, see what happens. And let's try this again. So um, aside from this that we're going to try, the next thing that I would find to see if there's a way to boot this into some kind of a safe mode. Now, I don't know what OS is running, maybe a low-level uh, Windows CE type thing. I'm not sure. It doesn't really give me any, any hints there. So let's see. Oh, I can't remember. Did it take this long when I turned it on last time for the screen to show up? Let's see, there it is. Okay, so that part is still the same. Now these LEDs are lighting up inside, meaning the power supplies are all working. There it is, and <laughs> it's, it's working now. Well, I'm sorry, this is not what I had in mind. Ah, that's frustrating. Anyway, I was hoping for a better repair than that. That's really annoying. So that cable getting unplugged, you know, it happens. It's not the first time I've picked up an instrument which has had a cable problem, uh, most likely, you know, due to 
vibration, thermal, who knows, it, it's got unplugged, even though it does have good latches. I really don't understand how something like this could have happened, but hey, look at that, it works. So at least it's giving me some numbers. I mean, it is going pl plus and minus, minus, but again, there's no cable connected. It's not calibrated, it hasn't been zeroed. So we're gonna have to do some measurements to see if it works, but before, I gotta fix that fan before it drives me crazy. So let me go and see if I can get the fan out. So if I don't seem overly enthusiastic about the fact that the unit all of a sudden works, it's because the whole point of this video is to do a repair and whenever I get something, it doesn't happen very often, but whenever I get something that just has a silly problem like this, it's a little frustrating because there's a quite a bit of effort, you know, picking up an instrument, finding something and trying to make a repair video out of it and then you end up with something like this. So now that it seems to be working and hopefully we get the f fan fixed, uh, then maybe I'll do a cool experiment with it, do something interesting with it so that the video will still be a you know, fun thing to watch. So even the fan is made in Japan, you see? Fantastic. So yeah, I just took it apart, going to do a little bit of cleaning, a little bit of extra lubrication, making sure it's nice and aligned and the fan is pressing uh, well against the ball bearings, it's a nice sealed ball bearings. Everything is very high precision. It's a quite nice fan. It's probably been running for who knows how many hours continuously in a production environment and it still works. So let's put it back together. All right, here we go. So the fan looks, uh, sounds a lot better, but uh, not as good as a brand new one, but significantly more quiet, uh, which is good. Now we cleaned up the inside of the unit, put it back together. Now we can try it out. Now I have it hooked up here to a test fixture. This is a 160478. These are actually ridiculously expensive. Why they would be so expensive, I have no idea, uh, but there's really nothing in there. So this allows us to measure directly uh, across these terminals. Now I haven't zeroed this. You have to zero it, you know, to make sure it's precise and so on, but uh, for our purposes, it's gonna be fine. Now I'm gonna compare it here through this, to this uh, BK Precision LCR meter. I'm using that because it's a nice portable one. I do have a, an HP 4338A, which is a really, really good, or, or B, I should say, LCR meter, but uh, it's again sitting somewhere else on the bench. So we're gonna use this to do a comparison. So let's try a really small capacitor, well, at least, relatively small capacitor. I think this thing is complaining because it's trying to turn off. No, I don't want you to turn off. Well, I don't know why they made the user interface for that. So annoying. Okay, here we go. So there we go. This, this capacitor says four zero on it. So that four zero should be uh, a hint to you what that size is. But anyway, let's go ahead and measure that. Let's measure with this guy. Now I'm going to cal it. Now we're going to calibrate this, so we're going to measure and open at one kilohertz. There it is. So roughly, you now it's now measuring 0.1 picofarad. We can go ahead and connect our capacitor to it, and let's see what we read. Do we read what we expect? And we read 40 picofarad, which is exactly what we would expect from a capacitor that has 40 written on it. Now we can also measure its quality factor. And let's measure this quality factor. Here it is, quality factor of 173. It's now jumping really high. High up there, it's kind of moving around a little bit. It's fairly high, the capacitor is small, so it has a bit of a difficulty measuring it. But let's just round it and say about 170. And I'm moving my hand around, that's gonna definitely affect the measurement, but I just wanna turn this back on so you can see it. There you go, so we have some numbers that we can work with. Now let's take this capacitor out, and let's put it into our test fixture, and let's see what the capacitance meter actually says. Here we go, and check it out. It's pretty close. We got a, a capacitance measurement of 40.2 picofarad, which is almost exactly what the other one was saying. Quality factor was 168. It's going up a little bit, maybe because it's cooling down after I was handling it in my hand. But yeah, it's kind of stabilizing now. The measurement makes sense. Now, this particular unit, has 120 hertz, one kilohertz, and one megahertz uh, measurement option. So this is option 001, which gives you one megahertz, which is actually quite expensive. I think it would be a several thousand dollars just, just to get this one megahertz measurement. But of course, it allows you to investigate the performance of the capacitor at these higher frequencies. You make faster measurements, and you will see if the capacitance is going to be self-resonating, and so on. So let's go ahead and measure the one megahertz. And check it out, look at that, at one megahertz, the same capacitance roughly, but the quality factor is enormous. Now this could be for a couple of reasons. It could be that it's right at the edge of uh, not being a capacitor anymore, so your quality factor shoots up, but it's an interesting uh, thing nonetheless to see. You have to investigate further to make sure that that is exactly the cause for this particular example, because we also haven't calibrated this, and you get there's strain ductances and, and so on in the setup, which are important. So let's go back to one kilohertz. Let me see that it makes sense. We can put a different capacitor in there. Let's say something a bit larger. 
uh, this one. Yep, there's a large capacitor right there. There you go, this should be about a nanofarad, so uh, uh, 960 picofarad. Looks good, quality factor about 420. Yeah, sounds about reasonable. I think the unit is definitely functioning uh, without calibration, obviously, but gives you some additional information, which is interesting. So the the voltage it's using as an excitation voltage, it's one volt, it's the largest one, it gives you the biggest dynamic range uh, on this. Now you have to be careful with this V-monitor, sometimes putting a large voltage in the capacitance can actually change the capacitance, there is absorption and so on, other effects into play, so you choose your V-monitor carefully for that purpose, but this is right now set to the maximum. And there's an I monitor, six microamps, a tiny, tiny amounts of current that is using that angle between the, the monitor current and the voltage and so on in order to calculate exactly what the uh, capacitance is. And then from that, from the looking at the real and imaginary part, you can then figure out the uh, different losses through this and model the capacitor and so on, which is very common techniques. We do this in integrated circuits as well when we want to model capacitors working you know, in 100 gigahertz or above. Um, so we do have to do exactly the same kind of analysis, but we do it with an uh, electromagnetic simulator. So this instrument is able to characterize the capacitors using either a parallel equivalent circular model or a series equivalent circular model. There's really no difference, it's just how you want to capture the imperfections of the capacitor. Now these are the absolute simplest models you can have for a capacitor. These are lumped models, but in reality, a capacitor is going to have inductances, resistances, conductances, and of course capacitance. And you need to capture all of those in a distributed model at very high frequencies to truly understand how it behaves. But for our purposes, if the capacitor is fairly good enough as a lumped model, this would be just fine. So whether you really uh, go with a parallel or a series, there's no difference. The quality factor is going to be the same. These equations are essentially identical once you calculate the correct values for them. So for our purposes, I thought it would be nice to use the series equivalent model because it's intuitively it's easy to appreciate a series resistance with a capacitor as an imperfection as a series that's built, a series resistance that's built into the capacitor, which we don't want, obviously. And ESR meters, for example, compute this for you in order to tell you how much resistance you have. And if capacitors are going bad, for example, you've seen me talk about this and explore this, then you know from the equivalent series resistance. So to test this unit, I thought I'll make a Leiden jar, as I explained earlier. But then I thought, you know what, I even made one. But it doesn't really show you the precision of this instrument and its ability to measure tiny changes in capacitance. And I even poured mercury in here in order to reduce the series resistance, and I thought that we could compare them. But then I thought, you know what, let's make something that actually showcases the uh, imp precision of this instrument rather than the fact that it can measure series resistance and so on. So I thought, let's make a parallel plate capacitor. Here's our parallel plate capacitor. This is made of two PCBs. Now copper surface is on the inside from both the top and the bottom plate of this capacitor and you can see the back of it is just non-conductive surface. Now this is FR1 I believe, the material. So now we have a capacitor, its dielectric is air and then we can calculate the capacitance based on the, the thickness of the dielectric, the total surface area from the top and the bottom plate and that gives us the total capacitance. Now there are some other stray capacitance effects here. For example, there's going to be fringe around it. That's going to contribute a little bit. These plastic standoffs are going to have a different dielectric. They're going to change the capacitance a little bit, but it doesn't matter. For our purposes, we do have a parallel plate capacitor now. But because we can measure tiny changes in capacitance, what happens if I were to change the dielectric with some more PCB material? So here's another same type of material as this. I've just put some tape on it so that it's non-conductive on both surfaces, and it fits just in between the two plates. So if I were to insert it between the two plates, I should be able to measure the change in the capacitance. And it's going to be a function of how far I have inserted the dielectric in between the two parallel plates. In fact, if I measure the maximum capacitance and the minimum capacitance, I could then interpolate and be able to estimate exactly how far this has been inserted. Basically, I'm making a ruler based on dielectric constant and capacitance changes. And this is interesting, and I think we should be able to measure it with this unit. So what I'll do is I'll hook it up like this. One port here, one port here. And this is going to give us the absolute minimum capacitance that this unit is going to have, and it's on a non-conductive surface over here. So I'll try not to touch it, and then we can go to the unit and take a look and see if I can get everything in, on camera at the same time. And then we're going to insert this into the capacitor and see the change in the capacitance. So you can take a guess how much is going to change. You kinda, kinda roughly have an idea of the dielectric constant of this is. So you should be able to estimate how much the capacitance is gonna change. 
All right, here's our measured capacitance. So right now, the capacitance is 17.7 picofarad, series resistance 250 kilo ohm, which is impressive. This can, can measure even up to mega ohms. So let's, you know what, let's change it back. Let's put it on to quality factor, a little bit easier perhaps to relate to. And there we go. So there's a quality factor of about 35 or so. CS, 17 picofarad. So let's go ahead and insert our little dielectric in between the two parallel plates of the capacitor right here in the corner. I hope you can see everything. And let's see how much the capacitance changes. So here's 17. I'm going to slowly put this in, the, in here. There we go. And then check it out. As I insert this more and more in between the two plates, you can see the capacitance steadily going up. And then all the way, there it is. We go to 27 picofarad. So there was a change of 10 picofarad. Now I can measure exactly what the size of that is. We can divide it up and we can get some change in capacitance per unit length. And then we can estimate based on that, based on the equation, to find out exactly by fitting it onto the curve where the ruler is, how far it's been inserted between the two parallel plates of the capacitor, and then kind of make a measurement system. In fact, changing capacitance as a function of changing dielectric material and changing dielectric thickness is a very common technique to build different kinds of measurement instruments. Some scales use a change in capacitance. Microphones are, of course, variable capacitors based on a vibration and a change in the dielectric thickness. So it's a very common technique, but it works so well. And by the way, this is on 16 times averaging. So even with 16 times averaging at 1 kilohertz, it is exceptionally fast. Look how fast this instrument runs. It's really quite amazing. And look at how many digits we're getting. I mean, we're, we're into the, into the femtofarads. So Let's go back, and we sh you should go back to exactly where it was. There it is. You can see 17. So I'm going to put it kind of roughly halfway. Here is, there uh, we go, about halfway. You get half the capacitance increase. So it's very nice and repeatable. And then you can see the quality factor doesn't really change that much. You can see the quality factor is 31. And when it is completely out, you can see it's roughly the same. It doesn't change that much. I'm not really dominant uh, by this dielectric that I'm, that I'm inserting into the unit. Anyway, so I hope you like this video. It's much shorter than I was uh, hoping it to be, and you know, it doesn't, doesn't have as much detail as I was hoping to get into it, but hopefully you still enjoyed it, taking a look at this, some simple experiments, and learning a little bit about the Azure and E4981A uh, as well. If you have any questions, let me know in the comments section. I have a bunch of other repair videos. Hopefully they'll be more interesting. I'll see you next time.